I've treated hundreds of patients and trained thousands of healthcare professionals over my 15 year career. And one thing I've learned through that experience is that most people are really confused about supplements or they lack a clear strategy or plan for how to use supplements to improve their health. That's why I created Adapt Naturals. It's a supplement line designed to add back in what the modern world has squeezed out and help you feel and perform your best. Our ancestors' diets were rich in the essential vitamins and minerals and phytonutrients we need for optimal function. But today, thanks to declining soil quality, a growing toxic burden, and other challenges in the modern world, most of us are not getting enough of these critical nutrients. I formulated Adapt Naturals using the principles of evolutionary biology and modern research to fill the nutrient gaps that we face today and replicate the nutrient intakes found in an optimal ancestral diet. Our flagship offering is called the Core Plus Bundle, a daily stack of five products that gives you everything you need each day, from essential vitamins and minerals like B12, folate, magnesium, and vitamin D, to phytonutrients like bioflavonoids, carotenoids, and beta-glucans. You can also order the products in the bundle separately if that works better for your needs. The Adapt Naturals products are made from the highest quality, food-based, or bioidentical ingredients, from cellular and immune health to brain and nervous system support to blood sugar and heart health, we've got you covered. Your supplement cupboard is about to get a lot smaller. We also created an app called Core Reset to help you get your nutrition, sleep, movement, and stress management dialed in. Because no matter how good our supplements are, and they are really good, you can't supplement yourself out of a bad diet and lifestyle. The best part is that you get this app at no additional cost when you order the Core Plus bundle. Head over to adaptnaturals.com, that's A-D-A-P-T naturals.com, to learn more and start feeling and performing your best. Hey everybody, Chris Crosser here. Welcome to another episode of Revolution Health Radio. Most of us at some point in our lives, either consciously or unconsciously, have swallowed other people's ideas about what's best for us, what kind of life we should live, what direction our, our work or personal journey should take. And if these ideas are not questioned and interrogated, we can find ourselves living a life that isn't right for us and not the life that we want to live. I'm really excited to discuss this topic with Terry Trispicio. She's an award-winning writer, speaker, brand advisor, and the author of Unfollow Your Passion, How to Create a Life That Matters to You. Her TED Talk, Stop Searching for Your Passion, has received seven and a half million views as of today. And it's pretty clear that that topic has struck a nerve. And that's because this idea of following your passion as a means toward happiness and fulfillment is so deeply ingrained in our culture that few of us even question it anymore. But what if that's not the best approach? Uh, what if following your passion is not a viable path for many people? And what if we don't even know what our passion is to begin with. What if building skill and developing capacity in a particular area can be a pathway to discovering passion that you didn't know you had? And what if exploring your own creativity, memory, and intuition is the best way to unlock your own unique path to meaning while also confronting the challenges that can get in the way like boredom, fear, hesitation, or loss. These are some of the topics that I'm going to explore in this conversation with Terry. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, these are things that I've thought a lot about in my life because my life has taken some very unexpected twists and turns that I never could have planned uh, were, were I planning it out and, and yet delivered me in, into a destination that I am extremely happy with and that I find really rewarding and fulfilling. So I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. Let's dive in. Terry, thank you so much for being here. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you. So you and I have known each other for quite a while. Yeah. Uh, had a fantastic <laughs> working relationship. And I've been aware of, of your TED Talk from 2015 for many years called Stop Searching for Your Passion. It's clearly struck a nerve. It's over seven and a half million views now. 
And this is a topic that I've, I've been interested in for many years. I read Cal Newport's book, uh, which covered some similar ground. You know, I had him on the podcast and I've, I've followed his work in other areas. And I, I'm in a totally different arena of life. I'm someone who questions the status quo and you are that person as well. Yes. And this is a, this is a pretty popular idea that, you know, whether we're talking about young people who are just graduating from college or people at any age that the, the way to achieve happiness is to follow your passion, you know, it's to identify your passion and then pursue yeah. it doggedly, uh, until the end of time and <laughs> ha happily ever after. Right. But you, that's you, right. Uh, you raised some questions about that in your talk. So why, why is it that you think that that talk struck such a nerve given our culture's obsession with this idea of, you know, passion, pursuing our passion? Well, it works in my favor with SEO because so many people are Googling, how do I find my passion? Because there's this cultural, you know, rule that this is how you will find happiness and fulfillment. And so when people search it, they find that talk where I say, yes, yeah, stop, stop searching for it. And it's so counterintuitive, of course, not by accident. You and I both know that being counterintuitive is the way to disrupt people's patterns of thinking. Um, but I wasn't just trying to be contrary. I really don't love the advice. But what happens is people find that talk, it's 10 minutes, and people have written to me from all over the world for the past how many, seven years, saying it changed their life. Now, it's not because I'm some kind of scientist or I invented something. Like we think that those rare geniuses are the ones who change their lives. But all I did was help them nudge, push back against the idea. And the reason they love it and share it and why it still is watched by so many people is because it's a relief. We want to watch and consume things that that actually <laughs> that don't make life harder. They make us realize that, oh, we weren't doing it wrong. And this fear that if I don't find my passion, hurry up and find it like a hidden Easter egg. If I don't, then I fail, that my life won't be as good as someone, someone else's life. And that's the fear. But it's just not. Well, the reason I hate it is because I, I really dislike um, advice that's very facile. People love to be like, oh, well, I, you know, it's very good in retrospect too. People will say, oh, how did I get here? I followed my passion, of course. Well, going forward, as Steve Jobs says in that famous commencement speech, you only know that when you look back. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. I mean, functional medicine clinician was not on my short list of, you know, pro <laughs> professions that I was going to find myself in when I was a kid. I had, I, I mean, and I was that kid who, when you asked me what I wanted to, to be when I grew up, the answer changed, you know, literally every day. And I probably had five or six different answers and surfer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Surfer Pro one. surfer and skateboarder did not work out. Um, <laughs> that maybe what would have been a uh, number one choice, but right. You know, Maybe not. Things change over time, right? And that's a big theme, your work that we're going to come back to later. But I, I remember distinctly, actually, even at that young time in my life, feeling envious of the, the other kids who were asked that question who had one answer, and that answer ch was the same every year <laughs> that they were asked, you know, in school, what what is that I have one guy in mind, actually. It was a little, it was a little weird because even in, in like middle school and high school, he was reading the financial section of the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> you know, it's just like the, not the Jesus, typical. Sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> and you'll never guess where he ended up um, on Wall Street. You know, he and and now he works in M and A mergers and acquisitions. And for that guy, he was clear from day one, what he wanted to do, what he was passionate about, what direction his life was going to take. And I remember, you know, I was pretty clear at that time that I didn't want to end up doing what he wanted to do, but I was, I was envious of the, of the passion, the single-minded purpose, you know, and the passion that he had. And I, when I looked around and I saw other people that had that kind of singular focus, I thought something was missing for, for me because I didn't have that. So I can definitely relate on a personal level. I know a lot of people in my life that can relate, and clearly there's more than seven and a half million people who are relating to, to, to what you said in that TED Talk, but that obviously eventually came something bigger for you. You wrote a book called Unf Unfollow Your Passion, so this evolved into 
something much more than the TED Talk. So what does that mean yes. to unfollow? Well, I have to hack up on you for that guy, the 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 like mm -hmm. 10-year-old reading the Financial Times. What the funny thing is, he's the one you remember. Right. That right. means most people weren't, right? And oh, that's the thing. For sure. He, that was, he was an anomaly. Person, he was an anomaly. And here's the thing. Some people tell themselves, say, you probably heard this a lot. People are like, I'm going to be a doctor when I grow up. Why? Because I like to help people. Turns out there's a lot of ways to help people. And mm -hmm. sometimes being a doctor is one of the hardest ways to help people. But people who cling to this idea, which is what I'll get to, why unfollow your passion matters, they cling to it for whatever reason. It doesn't always mean because it's the correct divine answer. But later on in life, when they realize all they want, thought they wanted to be was a lawyer or something, and then they realize they hate it, it's actually then harder to unpack and to maybe to leave because well, I, uh, they feel like maybe they've lived a lie. I'd rather discover new truths along the way than feel that I have done something that was a lie or that, that I didn't really want to do. So that's the the heart of it. I mean, to be honest, when I wrote this book, it, it didn't have a title to the very end. And I knew that it had to connect to that talk because the talk did so well. And of course, you know, my publisher was like, uh, you kind of have to, you're, you can't ignore that monster of a thing. And I was like, okay, but my, my feeling that you can watch the talk in 10 minutes and you'll get the, the, the gist of it. Right. But the book is not just going on and about with that one point. The reason I wrote the book was because that's just one piece of advice that we're fed. But when we break that down, we have to start to look at all of the things we've been told about what we should do to lead, to lead a, a meaningful and fulfilling life. And so the book was really my taking down one idea after the other, you know, how I even came up with the TED Talk idea. I heard there was a spot at this TED event first. I didn't, oh, my whole life I wanted to give this talk. No, I didn't. I wanted to give a TED Talk. I was like, I'd love to do that. I wonder what I'll talk about. And the guy said, this wonderful, brilliant curator of this TEDx event, one of the biggest in the country at the time. And he said, well, what are you going to do to talk about? And I was like, well, I'll tell you some advice I really hate is I hate this follow your passion advice. And he was like, tell me more. And then he said, well, what's the answer? I said, I don't know yet, but I'll write the talk and we'll figure it out. That is not how you would normally pitch a TED talk. But he said, I like this idea. I really like it. I discovered it as I unpacked it myself. But because that was under my skin as a thing that really bothered me, it was really easy to write a lot of pages about stuff that bothers me. But the heart of it is unfollowing your passion does not mean that you don't follow your passion, that you give up on finding one or on having it in your life. The point of it is we have to recognize that we don't have to have, know, or be a thing to live a life that is incredibly rewarding and fun and worth living so that you don't think you're, you're one ticket short of the full ride. I love that idea. And there, there are definitely some parallels to functional medicine that we've talked about in the past. I think, you know, you, one is you have to have the di diagnosis before you have the cure. Uh, and you talk about this in, in the book uh, in terms of essentially taking an inventory on all of the things that we've swallowed, all of the idea, other people's ideas, other people's beliefs, other people's purposes and principles and plans and strategies and the ways they think that you should be in the world and 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 mm -hmm. set up your life and a lot of that is unconscious because it's it goes back really far <laughs> you know maybe even yeah to pre-verbal time you know times when we were so young we weren't even really conceptualizing what we were taking in and, and, and processing so what does that diagnostic process look like for you uh, when you work with people and you do workshops and what you talk about in the book? Because I think that's a really important starting place that people can't yeah. gloss over. No. And I think that we, we live in a guru driven culture. I mean, uh, expert driven culture. We, if we, if we go to enough experts, someone's going to give us the answer. And and I tell people right off the bat, I don't have one answer for you. And if I did, you should get your money back because that's not fair. I don't have an answer to your life. But what I tend to hear is people saying, I'm stuck. I can't find my way, find my voice. I can't do this. I have ideas about it, not because they can't do it, but because they, they don't see this, you know, these walls that are around them that are basically maintained by them. They were put there by other people internalized critic, cultural expectations, all of the things. But when someone says to me, 
Cause I hear this all the time. Like I'm stuck. I'm just stuck. I'm like, are you stuck? Or like, if you're at a, on a road and it splits and goes in two different directions, are you stuck? No, you can't go any further till you pick a direction. And because we think, well, we have to pick the right one. I don't want the right one. So, so I can't move forward. The stuck is often an indecision unless you are literally, uh, in a, a country where you are under you know, Taliban rule, something where you literally are going to risk your life to do this, uh, that's crazy. And even those brave souls find ways, some of them, to, to get out from under it. But I'm talking about people who are feeling stuck around things that they're in their head about. Uh, and the problem is, if they decide on what they want to do, usually it's between what they want and what other people expect or want of them. The fear is not that I can't do something I wanna do. It's that if I do, I will disappoint. And the one trade-off is if you're going to live a life that is yours, that you really want and love, you better believe you're gonna to have to disappoint some people. And some people would rather not ever do that. And if you don't, if the biggest goal is I will please serve and fail to disappoint anyone, then that's okay, but that's the life you're choosing. You cannot choose a thing, make everyone love and accept it. And I'll only do that when everything's perfect. And that's the trade-off. That's the yeah. trade, but a lot of people aren't willing to make it. It's also, I think, ultimately impossible because if you're trying to please everyone, you're not, you know, not everyone has the same, uh, is pleased in the same way. And so you're going to end up bending yourself into a pretzel shape and, and probably even failing at that because it's, a, it's an impossible uh, goal to achieve. Yeah. I mean, the other thing that stands out to me about what you said is we have a, in, a very linear concept of getting from you know, point A to point B. And you know, sometimes the fastest uh, way to get from point A to point B is a straight line, but that, that's not always true. Right. Sometimes the route is much more circuitous and yeah. nonlinear and and even fractal. Um, and so this concept of being lost, I think, is is somewhat tied to that linear conception of how you get from from one goal to the next. Because I certainly when I look back on my life, I could look at, you know, long stretches of time where if you were if I was if you're looking at it from the outside in, it would not have been clear how it was going to end up where I actually did end up. And it certainly wasn't clear to me. Like I had, I had no idea at various times where I was going to end up. And if I had sat down, like with my journal, and tried to plan that out as a career path, absolutely no way that I could have conceived of it and figured it out. No possible way. It was a process that was very organic of essentially putting one foot in front of the other and sometimes very incremental baby steps and sometimes steps backward or to the side or around in circles even. But the destination that I arrived at was far, a far better fit for me and far more enriching and satisfying and rewarding than anything I could have planned for myself. I mean, would you have said, you know what I'll do? Maybe if I get sick, something will happen <laughs> and it'll change my life. I mean, that was the horrible thing. No one would want to go through what you went through and be sick for so long. And, but how many people do endure a horrible health condition or an accident or what have you? And it's not that they switch a career like that, but they start to gain an insight into something, maybe a problem that they see could be solved that they couldn't have imagined solving because they didn't know it was a problem before. And so it's not you, some people might say, well, you were meant to do this. Like, okay. But if you had a different thing happen to you, you'd probably be doing something different. Right. I mean, the example I give in the book is Barbara Corcoran, who's one of the biggest names in real estate. And I saw her live at the 92nd street Y here in Manhattan. She was there with a couple of her friends from the shark tank and they were talking about their success. And someone of course raised their hand in the audience and said, what role has passion played in your success? And two of the male sharks started and said, well, of course, I've always been passionate about da, 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 da. And I've always been, oh yes, it's so important, which is often what people tell you when they, when they had a really good run and they don't know how to tell you how to do what they did. And then they turned to Barbara and said, well, Barbara, you must be incredibly passionate about real estate because you're one of the biggest names in the business. And she said, no, in her Barbara Corcoran way. No, not really. And they said, that's impossible. You couldn't do as well without passion because I didn't really care about real estate. 
I loved building a team. I loved sales. I loved making money. She said, I loved having my face in the paper. I was compelled and propelled by growing something big. When Barbara Corcoran moved, first moved to New York City, she got a job answering phones at a real estate company, Gufuni Brothers Real Estate. And she looked around and was like, okay, I guess I'll do this. Like if she had been answering phones at a shoe company, she'd be one of the biggest makers of shoes. So passion to my mind, and that was evidence right there. And I wanted to stand up and give her a standing ovation for that, is that passion, you're like a lit match. Anything you come into contact with, you can burn that or you can burn something else. But the idea, and I hear this a lot from people who are usually younger than me. Well, I wasn't passionate about it, so I couldn't do it. I was like, is that it? I mean, you have passion in you. You can find something in there. Not that you have to stay at a job you hate, but the idea that someone better supply me with it is backwards. Yeah. And the idea that passion just hits you like a lightning bolt uh, and you it's a binary thing, whether you have it or you don't, or, or that- Great you, story. Yeah. You start with, <laughs> you must do, like you said, you must do something that you're passionate about to begin with. Whereas, as you point out in your book, and you know Cal Newport writes about this too, that passion mm -hmm. is often something that you grow into, that develops over time as a result of you know more familiarity, more skill, uh, which I want to come back to, uh, rather than necessarily talent. Uh, but as you develop skill in something, then over time you develop more of a passion for it because you 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 experience yourself as having some capacity, expertise, you, you're, you see how that's able to be useful for other people. And, and you, that really is something that comes about over time instead of just something that happens right off the bat. So it seems oh, like absolutely. that that's a huge shift for a lot of people, I think, especially young people, if they're graduating from college and they're, and they're like, wait, I, I don't have that one passion that some, some people seem to have. So, so what, right. what, what, what paths are open to me? It's almost like if the only goal was, well, you have to make money. And I know that's a big goal because you have to, you can't live without it. But if that were the only thing people were told, then they'd probably be looking at that. But the culture is like, oh, loving what you do. There's incredible pressure to be in love all the time. In fact, one of the studies I found the most interesting, which got a lot of attention and everyone I knew sent it to me, is a study that was published in Psychological Science. Uh, Carol Dweck and Paul O'Keefe and their team were studying people, uh, were wanted to know if people with a fixed mindset about passion, you know, fared differently than people with a growth mindset. And of course, fixed mindset, you're dyed in the wool, this is who you are, growth mindset, I can become, evolve, and learn from my mistakes and also discover new things about myself. I have potential. Now, we're fixed in growth mindset about different things, but it, we're, this was specifically about passion. And the people who had a fixed mindset about passion believed that it was set, that they were meant to do it. And they also expected they would have boundless, boundless motivation once they found it which is an unfair expectation of anything. What happened was when they, and there's a whole thing to this, they would give people a, a fun video about astronomy and then they give them a really hard academic paper about astronomy. And when the people who believe they were meant to do astronomy, for instance, were given this difficult task, a lot of them said, oh, I must have the wrong passion. This must not be the right thing. And then they'd have to stop and start again. In fact, people who have a fixed mindset about passion are more likely to quit when things get tough. Whereas someone who say in my world, I know a lot of writers, a lot of people writing for a living. If you really think you're a writer and after one rejection, you're done, then this isn't the life you want, first of all. But yeah, the people who are successful- going to be easy every time you sit oh down gosh. and do it. Uh, good luck with that, right? <laughs> but like anyone will look at that and go, well, I don't want that to be me. But you can see how that built-in belief works against us because we expect too much of it. Whereas the growth mindset, people are like, maybe I'll be a writer and I'll do this and I'll do that. And it was just a real eye opener for me. What about the flip side where following something you're passionate about might not actually be the best choice in terms of a career path or, or, or you know, maybe getting overly fixated on your passion could blind you to other possibilities or something that yeah. might even be a better fit for you for other reasons. You know, maybe, maybe it's maybe following your passion is not the best thing to do in some cases. 
Well, it's also the pressure. And, and I was just saying about money. There's also pressure in our culture to monetize what you love, that if you really love it, if you're really that good, then you must make your living from it and the majority of your living from it. So if Denise makes amazing cookies, someone in the room is going to go, you should sell these. You should open a cookie shop. And it's like, does Denise want to run a cookie shop? Maybe she just likes making cookies. But if Denise goes, yeah, I'm going to quit my job and open this shop and it's going to be great. What Denise is doing most of the time is in the back room worrying about how she's going to pay the rent and doing spreadsheets and accounting and running a business. She's not making cookies. Whereas making cookies every week and giving them away might be a lot of fun. So this idea of having to make a living from a thing is worth questioning because who said you had to get paid a lot of money to do one thing when it can still compensate you with a life full of fulfillment? Well, yeah. Going back to pro surfing, like not that I could have <laughs> been a pro, not, not that I could have been a pro surfer, but I don't think I would have wanted to be because it takes something that I was doing that purely for the joy of doing it and really changing the experience of it. And, and it, and I was just having this conversation with a dear friend who is, you know, has a vision for doing in-person retreats with a, you know, a particular audience and, and demographic. And he's really good at this. He's passionate about it. He's already done this work. And he was thinking about scale, like, you know, the, the, the sort of Silicon Valley idea that everything need, that is worth doing needs to be scaled up to, yes. and turned into yes. a billion and a unicorn billion dollar yes. business, I think has been so done such a disservice to so many people like this idea that that model for for Dropbox or you know Facebook should just be rubber stamped onto every possible human endeavor that we might want to explore and as we we're having this conversation we he got to the place where he realized that all of the efforts and the thinking that he was going through with this partner to try to think about how to make it up into a big business were totally disconnecting him from the core of what yes. really mattered to him about it. And he was starting to become disconnected from the whole idea and thinking about not doing it at all. And then, you know, in the process of this conversation, we came around to like, no, this is totally worth doing, but it's worth just doing and it can still even be profitable but it's probably something that will not grow hugely over time. It won't require outside investors. You know, it's not, not everything that we do falls into that category. Is that, and you have to ask yourself, if that's the vision of what success must be, that everyone has to be a disruptor and everyone has to be a star founding CEO, first of all, there'll be nothing left to disrupt. And secondly, how do you know that that's a happier place to be? You know, I, I write about my sister in the book. My sister's an amazing singer. Anyone who would sit and listen to her sing would be like, oh my, you could have made a living doing this. Of course she could have. She knows she has the voice. She's gotten the attention. And she said, if I try to make a living from this voice, I will resent it. Because then every, the voice rules me. I can't drink and I can't, I have to have warm things around my throat and I have to have the tea, I can't shout. And then she said, on top of that, I'd have to be, at a theater every night, if I'm lucky, if I'm lucky enough to make a living doing this, I either have to be in a theater every night or I have to be on tour. I don't want either of those things. She said, I, the idea of being on a tour bus and being a big success, nightmare. I want to have a job, be done, be on my couch with my kids and a dog by five o'clock every night and in bed by 8.30. You can't do that and be a recording artist. But when people say to her now, oh, you could have been something, she takes that offensive. She says, I made the life I wanted and I'm incredibly happy. Why do people think, oh, she could have? That is a cultural thing. We're all to blame for that. Uh, but it doesn't bode well for, for actually making a, a decent and fine living and doing things you love that don't make you a unicorn. I can't think of things I'd rather be less right now. Absolutely. <laughs> There's a lot, a lot of downsides that come with that, with scale as anyone who's been through that process could, could tell you. And so, but it, but it, it does strike me that that, I think there is kind of a gestalt that that's just the expectation of what comes with success and, and you even are seeing that in young kids now, like uh, uh, kids are starting their own YouTube oh. channels, you know, oh. or, or they're becoming TikTok influencers. And, you know, if, if, if they went out and did a lemonade stand and it was successful, then, you know, they're scaling their lemonade stand to multiple different neighborhoods. And it, it, it's, oh uh, it's an insidious idea that I think is 
become so woven into our culture that few people mm -hmm. even question it now. And it, it's, it's right up there with this idea of, of self-improvement, which you talk about in your book. And uh, you, uh, you have <laughs> self-improvement. So you, you have a, uh, I want to talk about your perspective about this, but just the context, like for me, this has always been a little bit of a, of a razor's edge because, oh, yes. <laughs> because, you know, on the one hand, I'm deeply invested in developing and growing in my life. Like I want to be able to communicate better with my wife and my daughter. I want to, to feel, you know, to be able to connect with them more deeply. I want to be able to become aware of the ways that I get in my own way and and to have the satisfaction that comes with being a clear vessel, like being able to really function in, in, in my highest purpose and connect, like I said, connect with people to be a better listener. That could be called, some people would call that self-improvement. But in my way of thinking about it, that's just becoming a, a like growing into myself, like becoming more myself, essentially. <laughs> uh, um, but it's really tricky because there's this whole industry out there which is based on the idea that there's something fundamentally wrong with you, with us, with me, and that in order to be happy, we need to fix all of those things that are broken. So it, it might seem like a subtle difference, but it's, I think, a a huge difference and a and a difference between you know being happy and being miserable really and when it comes down to it so yeah break break that down like how you look at that well self improvement is tricky because we always have to remember the culture and the society we live in it's an industry people are making money off books that help them be their best selves i'm one of them i understand it people are selling courses doing all these things i think that it's one of those things where most of the people who are in that space talking about this are well-intentioned. I believe most of them are. Um, I don't think everyone's out to trick people into being, but no one wants that, right? But the tricky thing is the word fix. It's about where you begin from. If I begin as a, from a place of lack, well, I don't know anything. So everyone has to fill me with their knowledge and tell me how to do stuff. I either come empty and useless until someone puts that meaning inside me, which is, you know, not really true at all, or I'm this thing, but I'm damaged and broken because of things that happened to me and I can never unkink that hose and I'll, I'll never be right. And so there's that idea, both negative ideas. The word fix is something I've uh, gotten hung up on because I was like, well, let me think, because I'm, I really like to look at the words, look at the language, the things that we're using to describe these things. Fix to affix, to fix, is to fix, to secure in place. So if you have a pipe that's loose and water is spraying, you need to fix it because it needs to be secured in place. But the idea that you, in order to be a better person, to be a happier person, better, whatever, you have to be fixed means that you have to be secured in place. And it's the opposite. We already talked about how being fixed around things doesn't help us at all, really. And in fact, what we need often is the opposite. We need to let go. We need to loosen up the grip on who we think we can be, who we think, what we think will happen or should happen, our big plans, all the things we have on the list of what we're going to achieve. Letting go of that has been one of the most powerful things for me personally, as someone who, like many people, suffers from generalized anxiety disorder, right? Like I'm nervous about something. But my mother always said to me, when I was little too, all my whole life, honey, just try to try to go with the flow of it. Like, just try to flow with it. And I was like, trying, trying, but that is true. Flow is the opposite of fix. So it's fine. Read the books. They inspire you to make you feel good. If something makes you feel bad, it's probably not right. But the idea that you are the problem is not the problem. Our culture is sick sick, sick, sick. And we're trying to thrive inside of it as you do in your world of health, of knowing that we've overdone everything in our world and, and need to achieve health by going back to our ancestral roots. I feel like that sense of wholeness is what I would like people to feel. So you asked me earlier and I, did, I didn't answer the question. You said, um, I didn't get to it. You said, well, what do you do? What do you say to people you work with in workshops? And I think it's pretty important to mention this now. 
I lead workshops for people who want to, as, as I have come to say, want to be self-expressed. They want to say things, write things, do things in the world and communicate those things. Not everyone wants to do that, but a lot of people do. Some call themselves writers. Others say, I'm not a writer, but I want to do those things. And the, the key here is that I was trained in a method. This changed my life. I didn't come up with it. It's a method called the Gateless Method. It was created by a woman named Suzanne Kingsbury, who's an editor, and she works with writers, and the writers were all blocked. How do I get them to tap the genius part? And she's done a lot of study on this, and I learned from her that focusing on what's working, not on what's not working, is the best way to get yourself in flow, to create, to communicate, to do all the things we want to do. Most workshops, coaching, whatever, I'll be like, well, let's look at what you did. What, let's look at that flaw. Talk therapy often focuses on let's look at and talk about what went wrong. There's always a place to address problems and conflicts. But in the work I do, my role, I feel, is to get people kind of on fire, to generate and create whatever it is that will bring them meaning. And as a critical person myself, I had to unlearn the looking for flaws and we teach what we most need to learn, right? And so in these workshops, I've gotten to be a better person because we emphasize listening. We write something on the spot, even people who don't write at all. We read what we wrote out loud, terrifying, but not because we don't say, you know what I would have written and you know what you should have said or why did you do that? There's none of that. We look at the work itself and we focus on what was strong. I love that moment when this happens. What a fantastic use of that detail. And the person, rather than feeling judged, feels completely seen. Not, oh, am I pretty enough? But like my, not looking at your appearance, anything like, it's the work. And what do we want? Fulfilling work. How do we do that? We have to look at what's working. And this changed my life. It's really how I was able to write a book. So I was like, I wouldn't write a book. No one's going to read a book by me. That went away when I learned to just write. And so I mentioned it because your whole comment about linearity and we have to go in this direction, we have to do this. What happens when you really open up and allow people to come into their own thoughts and get them on the page is that they discover all the rabbit holes, all the intuitive and undiscovered paths that lead them to things they love that you cannot find linearly. Mm. Let's talk amino acids for a moment. On my recent episode, Why Amino Acids Are the Building Blocks of Life, I discuss why we need amino acids at all stages of life and how key on aminos can help you live a long, active, healthy life. To truly understand just how vital amino acids are for health, think about your body and what it's made of. You've probably heard before that it's made up of mostly water. What you probably haven't heard is that everything else in your body is 50% amino acids. These building blocks of life are essential for health and fitness. This is why Keon Aminos is my fundamental supplement for fitness. I drink them every day for energy, muscle, and recovery. Keon Aminos is backed by over 20 years of clinical research, has the highest quality ingredients, no fillers or junk, undergoes rigorous quality testing, and tastes amazing with all natural flavors. So if you want to naturally boost energy, build lean muscle, and enhance athletic recovery, you need to get Keon Aminos. You can now save 20% on monthly deliveries and 10% on one-time purchases. Just go to getkion.com slash Cresser. That's G-E-T-K-I-O-N dot com slash Cresser to get my fundamental supplement for fitness, Kion Aminos. Vitamin C is a critical nutrient for immune function and antioxidant protection. Yet most people don't get enough in their diet, and most vitamin C supplements contain synthetic forms, GMO, sugar, or allergens like soy or corn. This is why I recommend whole food forms of vitamin C, which contain the full spectrum of vitamin C activity without GMOs or other junk. And my favorite whole food vitamin C product is Essential C from Paleo Valley. It's made with three of the most potent vitamin C rich superfoods on the planet, one of which is 120 times more potent than an orange. Nothing synthetic, no weird questionable ingredients, just food. Right now, they're offering my community an exclusive 15% off discount. Just go to paleovalley.com slash Chris and use the code CRESSER15 to get 15% off. Yeah, this is, uh, it's really resonating. Uh, you, I think you know this, Terry, from our work together, but this is one of the primary differences between health coaching or any kind of coaching and therapy or, you know, be, being a doctor 
you know, doctors give advice um, and they try to fix what's broken. That's sort of inherent in the, in, in, you know, that's the expectation <laughs> that the patient comes in with, hey, this is broken, it's not working the way I want it to, you doctor fix this. Um, that's sort of the implicit agreement. Whereas in health coaching or any kind of coaching is based on positive psychology, which is what you're referring to. Which, and, and that's the idea that we get bigger gains when we build, upon, build on what's already working rather than trying to fix what's broken. And I think where people get stuck there is, is the idea that, oh, well, that means I'm just going to have to live with those things that are broken for the rest of my life and never expect <laughs> yeah. any progress. Like there's this sort of, I think that straw man thing happens. But what really happens and what you were alluding to is that when we are able to transfer skills or apply what we know helps us in, in areas in our life that we're th where, we, where we thrive to the areas of our life where we're more challenged, that's a more likely way to make progress than approaching it from the it's broken, I'm broken kind of framework. I'm incapable. Like, right. It's more like, how can I take what I'm really good at over here and, and, and kind of study that and see or what are the basic, why am I good at this? How am I good at this? And how can I take those things that I already know and do well and apply them to this thing that I want to improve over here? Again, somewhat of a subtle might seem like a subtle shift or even just semantics, but it's so not. <laughs> it's, it makes all the difference in the world. Absolutely, because it's validating. And that's why I, I mean, it's important in a coaching relationship, in a group, you know, any of those things. Most, but it, say on a team at work, most people do not spend the time or effort to validate what's working or what's good. They assume you know what's good and let's save time and just go to the problems. But if you, if in the spirit of productivity, you want to just go fix, 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 what you're really doing, and this is particular with uh, teams, you're, you're kind of nipping things down to the bud. You're not allowing ideas to take root because the minute you cut someone off and tell them that idea, we tried that last year, Louise, it didn't work, remember? Oh, well, now Louise isn't going to say anything. So we get pushed down. This, what you're saying, why coaches are so important, why the workshops I lead and other teachers like me lead are important is because no one pointed out what was working. And therefore, how are we supposed to know to do more of it? If I say, Chris, your skill here is so powerful. Did you ever think of doing that over here? It's a forward movement, as you're saying, right? It's a way to point out what's working, which most of us never do. Yeah. I mean, the, the, <laughs> it's a, uh... It's a paradigm shift that I'm seeing happen in a lot of different areas, which is great. Like I'm encouraged by that because I think it's going to serve people so much better. While we're on the topic of of debunking some pretty uh, persistent myths about what how how we can actually live into this uh, life that we want to create for ourselves, what about this idea of getting out of our comfort zone? That's <laughs> a, I think this is another, it's another razor's edge too, because I can, I can objectively look at my life and say, there were lots of th times and, and, you know, up until very recently, and, it, and I imagine this will continue where there was a direction I wanted to move in. I knew that in my gut. And yet there was some fear or resistance mm -hmm. that came up and I didn't let that stop me. And I moved forward and, it, right. you know, it was a huge, um, but again, that's maybe slightly different than what we're talking about with our comfort zone, which is like if I'm naturally an introverted person and I don't enjoy being in situations where I'm constantly having to talk to a bunch of strangers, then should I constantly put myself in situations where I oh, need no. to talk to strangers because that's getting out of my <laughs> comfort zone? So, so again, I'm just setting that up. Those are, those are like two different ways that I think about it, where the, in the first case, that's there's actually a benefit to moving p through the fear or the hesitation. But in the second case, there's no real benefit to continuing to put myself in those situations if, that, if, if I'm just more comfortable being you know, w in a smaller group of people or, or just one-on-one -on -one with people. What do you think? Yes. <laughs> well, I think probably in your line of work, since you're a known entity, probably once or twice a year, you're going to have to be in a room with people you don't know, right? We, we all have to do that because <laughs> yeah. it serves another goal. But the idea that I should do that more because I don't do enough, we already know our society favors the extroverted and wonders what's wrong with the introverts who would really rather stay home. Thank you very much. I'm right there with you. My theory about the comfort zone comes from 
again, something that annoys me when people tell me I should be and be okay with being uncomfortable. And this rides the line of, and I'm going to say it, privilege, because people who have to deal with real hardship and real discomfort don't make a pastime of seeking discomfort because it's great for personal growth. That is the playground of the privileged. If you have to find ways to be uncomfortable, well, you're very lucky. Most of us spend most of our time slightly uncomfortable, even in your house, even thinking about like Sunday night, how many people are up, can't sleep because of what's just because Monday's coming. The understanding or the, the assumption is that most of us are just kind of comfortable, too comfortable. And in the name of progress and self-improvement, you should get out there and work harder and be scared, do something every day that scares you. Getting out of bed is pretty scary considering, you know, so this idea, I'm just flipping it. I'm not saying that you shouldn't take risks, that you should be complacent. I don't do either of those things. I don't favor staying where you are because it's too scary out there in the world. My perspective is the goal isn't discomfort. The goal is comfort because even the dudes who like are going to go into their uh, those overheated tents and meditate or do whatever they're going to do, crazy, walk on hot coals. I've done it, nutty stuff. If they on the way home are upgraded to first class, they're going to take it because we love comfort. We like to dabble in it to test ourselves, to dabble in that discomfort. You want to do that? Fine. But Chris, as a woman, I'm going to say, I don't like when men tell me I should be uncomfortable and be okay with being uncomfortable because it's something very dangerous there that, well, I should be uncomfortable. I mean, that's going into train that we weren't going to cover anyway, but I think it's important for women to realize it's not okay to just tolerate discomfort, which by the way, women through all of time have. And I say to men who tell women to be uncomfortable, you wouldn't last a day in my skin. Like we're uncomfortable, trust. My goal is to expand the comfort zone so that I am more comfortable in more places. For instance, I took a stand-up comedy class years ago and I started doing it for a couple of years. I, I wasn't learning my, talk about doing something for fun and not because you're earning any money. Stand-up comedy is a great hobby. If you'd like to try that, you will not make a dime. But I didn't do it because like, you know what's scary stand-up, which it is. I think I'm going to do that just to get out of my comfort zone. That's not why I did it. It's because I'm also a professional public speaker and I think comedians are some of the best public speakers ever. And I wanted to learn that skill. And I didn't want to discover, do I have some secret crazy talent? I know what I sound like. I know what my humor is. I want to learn how to engineer a joke and deliver it on stage. So I learned it. But in that first you know, day, we were all getting up to do it. And we're like, all right, why are you here? Why are you here? One guy's like, oh, it's on my bucket list. And I was like, oh, okay. So you're just here for the day? Like, you're not really in it. But when you say that, when you say, well, I'm just going to try it. It doesn't really mean anything. Then you're not all in. You're not all in. And so I am committing to being, continuing to be uncomfortable enough so that when I get on stage next time, I am more comfortable doing that. And so the idea for not letting Chris Kresser sit in a box in his house and never leave would be that he has to go out occasionally so that it is a little more comfortable than it was last time. But comfort, ultimately, look at everything we spend money on. Pretty sure we want to be comfortable and there's no shame in doing it which is another reason why the workshops that I run, I say, this is the comfort zone. Not because I'll coddle you because I will not. Not because I'll compliment you because that's not helpful. But because when people say it's a safe space, they're not clear usually. Is it safe for you or safe for me? And so really a safe space is we don't judge you. We look at the work, we support and listen to what your ideas are. And to me, that's the ultimate in comfort, knowing I'm not going to be criticized. And the rest of the world doesn't like that. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 th I just want to emphasize again, cause I, I do think I've seen a lot of people get stuck here and I, I think it's, it's just worth kind of riffing on a little bit more where at least I'm not saying, and I don't think you're saying that it's not valuable to like, if you feel drawn to move in a certain direction for good reasons and, and there's fear that comes up or hesitation that comes up and it's uncomfortable to move forward that that's not worth doing in some cases. Oh, but, yeah, you're right. The, I, of course. And I'm I'm not saying that you're saying this, but I know that some people will will you we'll know say, oh cool, I can just stay interp here. And interpret it this way, right? And and that's that's our monkey minds doing the monkey mind yes. thing. 
it, it, the difference again, like going back to positive psychology, like this is, this is a fundamental tenet of positive psychology again, is that like we, if, if there's something that comes easy, easily to you and where it's easy for you to get into a flow state with, and you're naturally good at, there's nothing wrong with building that, you know, with, with moving in that direction. Like there's, I think there's this kind of pervasive mentality in our, in our culture that that's not, that, that it, we'd be better off instead of ap applying more effort in that direction of something we're already good at and it already comes easy, we'd be better off like focusing on something that we're not good at and, and trying to bring that up to some level of parity with something like what? that we're, uh, we're uh, like accounting. Well, Cause I'm not going to do that. <laughs> well, that, yeah, I mean, that's what I'm saying. It's like, so my understanding of this is just, and I think we're on the same page is that there's value in, in moving through fear and hesitation. If we're going in a direction that we want Whoa. to go, that we want yeah. to go in and that we're not, that we're drawn to go in for whatever reason, but that this just getting out of your comfort zone for the heck of getting out of your comfort zone or in a, in a way that like really fundamentally goes against a natural innate quality that you have, that there's not really, that, that's kind of just pointless suffering. <laughs> it goes back to oh, like to just, no, no, just no, right. walking on hot, cold or sleeping on a bed of nails just to prove that you Bungie can do jumping. that, you know, bungee jumping. I'll never do it. And I don't think I'm missing out on anything, but to your point, I disagree. Uh, the discomfort. <laughs> just kidding. I've bungee jumped on and it was really fun, but that's a great example. Like that came easily and naturally to me. There was fear and hesitation, of course, because why? If, if there's not, there's something wrong with you and you're going to jump off a bridge, but I really wanted to do it. I didn't do it because you wanted it was, to do it. It wasn't about right. getting out of my comfort zone or overcoming that fear. It was about, it was like, Hey, that looks fun. Oh my God. I'd rather deliver a keynote naked than jump <laughs> off a bridge. Absolutely. But the thing is, you know, you've taught me a lot about coaching, about specifically how health coaching works and doesn't work. And I know you've trained lots of people on that. You know that in order for someone to move forward, the discomfort of saying where you are has to be bigger than the fear of moving forward, right? So there's always fear in moving forward. I'm afraid of everything and I do it anyway, knowing that I want to make that something that's mine too. And if you don't move forward because you're afraid, but where you are becomes untenable or just annoying, and you say, but it's easier to say here, you will just stew in resentment your whole life because you'd rather do that than encounter a moment of fear to try something else. I'm someone who will try, not everything clearly, but some things I get uncomfortable when I'm stuck somewhere too much. So if you're feeling stuck and if you're feeling uncomfortable in what was comfortable before, then that's all the more reason to push out and try something else. I think I just don't like the bravado of it. I think that's what it is like, come on, like that kind of vibe where I'm like, I want to do it so that I'm more comfortable later. That's the goal. Make it so that I expand my comfort zone so big that at the end of my life, it's a lot bigger than it was when I started. Yeah, that makes sense. And and sometimes I think the flip side of this is that discomfort can be a sign that something is is not. Yes. Right. You know, if, if we're in, for example, a certain relationship or, or, or career or doing something and we're, we're noticing mm -hmm. constant discomfort, it's worth, inter you know, like checking into that and seeing what that's about, not just bailing, I think. But if it consistently comes up, then it, it might be a sign that something needs yes. to change or we need to Agreed. move in a different direction. The discomfort is a sign. That's, the, that's exactly what it is. And you you listen to it. But the world's a scary place. It'll be, it, there's fear whether you push ahead or not. So if you're trying to avoid all discomfort, you're, you're not going to be able to do it. So if you're going to endure a little in order to be more comfortable, make sure it's in a direction you're doing intentionally. Yeah. So we, we touched very briefly earlier on skill and like how developing skill can actually help build passion, uh, it, it, even when it, in something that you weren't originally passionate about. Uh, this is another area where I think there's, there's a real cel a celebration of the wrong thing in our culture. So talent yes. is what is celebrated most like, wow, that guy's got talent or she's got talent. She's amazing. She's so talented, which is in some way a really, I, I think the quote was from Seth Godin in your book. Um, if I'm, yes. or, or it could have been somebody, but, but it's an, it's, it's an insulting, you know, if you see someone who's gotten to a really high level in some endeavor in life and you say, wow, you, you, you're so talented. You, you must really be talented as if they haven't worked their 
ass off you know, right. for, for decades right. in most cases to get to where they got to. And certainly in some cases, natural pl- talent plays a, a pretty big role. Like I, I'm certain I was a, a, a good basketball player. I almost played in college, but I, I, and I worked really hard. I don't think that if I worked three times as hard, I would have been LeBron James. Like, so, so we have to recognize <laughs> that there is some, there is some role for talent, but I think we way underestimate the importance of skill and skill building. Cause skills work. That's why we want magic. We want magic. Oh, they're magically talented. Oh, that person just has talent. It, it lets us off the hook too. Cause it says, well, they're talented. I can't do what they do. Let's look at comedians. I would be like, oh, well, they have a, they, they were born with a special gene and they're meant to do that. And I couldn't do that. And uh, one teacher I had said, you think comedians have to have good personalities? Most of them have horrible personalities. They're not even funny. He's like, all you have to do is learn how to get to tell a joke, write a joke, deliver a joke. You're a comedian. He's like, we, with this big personality business is not actually the business of comedy. We think, oh, they're just funny. Oh, I could be a comic. I'm funny. Are you willing to do the work? Because it's a nightmare, clearly. Uh, your point about, oh, there was something else about talent and skill I wanted to say. Yeah, talent is overestimated. And the skill means that we'd have to be willing to work at it. And you don't have to work at all the things you could do. There's only so many things we're going to do. Uh, but, but people say this to me. Okay, so that's something people say to me. Oh, you're so good. You're so good on stage. You're so good. In, you're, you're just a natural. You're a natural. I am not a natural. I naturally, it appealed to me. Something in me, it appeals to me to speak in public and all that. But to say someone is natural, a natural is very um, insulting in a way. Not very insulting, but it's an oversight. I would much rather say, wow, clearly you've worked very hard on your craft and you've worked hard to be that good. When you say natural, you undermine your ability. And my work, it's just not right. It's not helpful. Yeah. Well, I think we have time for one more myth or, right, or you know. Pick one. Pick uh, a myth, uh, any myth. I like it. You know, I, you know Terry, I, I, way back in the day, I was the healthy skeptic before, I was, uh, before it was chriscresser.com. So, and this one is actually something I've talked about a lot, uh, both with Cal, Cal Newport and... Um, Tim Kendall who was a, used to be the president of Pinterest and it, I've talked about it more in the context of screens and how much screens interfere with this which is b- boredom <laughs> and oh, boredom My- is a very <laughs> bad rap you know in our and and I've you know we hear it from kids at a very or, I'm bored dad <laughs> you know or a, and so I think we have almost like an entire industrial complex that has um, almost excused us from boredom. Like in uh, these days, if you so choose, and I don't recommend this, and we'll probably get to that in a second, you could probably almost never be bored. Like as long as you've got your smartphone and an internet connection, then you could do your best at least to not be bored. What's the problem with that? Well, uh, the expert I turned to who inspired this chapter of the book is a guy named Dr. Mark Hawkins, who wrote The Power of Boredom. And he says, if your people will say, oh, oh, I wish I could be bored. I'm just so busy. You know, I'm so important. Um, If you're busy, he says, you are very bored. You just don't know it. And it's this kind of busy, busy thing, like scrolling and typing. and We have a lot to keep us busy, a lot to keep us distracted. But what we're not doing is getting in touch with the boredom. We're we're running away from it, right? And the fear of boredom is actually the real problem. Because boredom, he describes it as just space. It's just this kind of where all meaning falls away. Because you can have all the shows on TV, you can have all the things and be like, I don't feel like watching any of it. We've all go through that. It is part of the human condition. It cannot be engineered out. The risk of not allowing yourself some boredom is that then there is no space. 
There is no place for your unicorn idea to emerge. There is no space to wonder what actually matters. Because if you're saying, I'm so busy because everything is so important, we all know that means nothing's important. But if you were to stop and have nothing quiet, I mean, nothing playing, doing nothing, you face the void. And that's so terrifying that people would rather be busy. Because if you stop and you don't work for a day, say you just take one whole day, you don't do any work and the world doesn't fall apart. The question is, is anything I'm doing really meaningful? Does it matter? And so the busyness is a way to reassert the importance uh, of everything, including ourselves. But if we're willing to sit in the boredom, that's actually where, speaking of magic, that's where things emerge. One of the stories I heard about in a documentary was that Walt Disney came up with the idea for Disney when he was sitting at a park and his kid was playing and I, he did not have a phone and there was nothing to do. And he said, wouldn't it be fun if there's a place where parents and their kids can play together? Cause this sucks sitting on this bench. And like, we don't allow that creative. We put a lot of cachet on creativity, innovation. We don't give ourselves any space to do it. So after I read that book, which took not very long at all, he knows his audience. I sat there and I did nothing. I said, I'm going to set a timer. I'm just going to sit here. It was terrifying. And I sat there and I did absolutely nothing. And I, th I did fall asleep for a minute, but I mean, it was really important. And since then, since I have gotten this in my head about boredom, thanks to him, I make sure there's a portion of my walk where I listen to nothing and do nothing but walk. What are we missing out on if we're just watching replays of everyone else's ideas instead of coming up with our own? Yep. That's been true for me for many years. And you know, when I was 17, I started meditation practice. My dad introduced me to it. And for most people who are not familiar with that, you know, especially at that time where it was not, you know, people in Google and everyone else talking about meditation, they were like, wait, you're doing what? You're sitting. Wasn't sexy yet. <laughs> you're, you're doing a retreat where you're sitting and facing a wall and staring at the wall for 14 hours a day. Like, are you insane? Why, what, what are you thinking? It does sound crazy. And then, you know, now, like most of my best ideas come when I'm on my mountain bike or I'm skiing or I, and I never, personally, I never listen to podcasts or music, even music on those kinds of things, because I just know that that's where that space that opens up when I do that is, is, is what, is what allows for those new ideas or, you know, reflection, making sense of our own experience. There's the, the def default mode network kicks in where, there's sort of the self-review and the, and all of this stuff that, that actually the brain is incredibly active in those periods. That's what we know. Like we think that boredom is a state of nothingness or nothing's happening. On the contrary, there's a ton of stuff. And they've done brain scans on people and they see all this really rich stuff is happening. It's just not stuff that we're necessarily consciously guiding or or directing ourselves or, think, or that's even coming to us in the form of thoughts that we can interpret. So... I love that you included really that in your book because I I feel like the lack of this is 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 a huge experiment that we're performing on on ourselves as a human race That's with right. very unknown results and and probably not good ones. Well, it brings us back to the idea of like I should have boundless motivation. I should be passionate. No one is passionate every second of the day. It is metabolically exhausting, and we could not sustain it. You know, no one's ecstatic all the time. We need those periods of fallowness, right? Of rest and thinking and reflection. And without it, we are going to lose something vital. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Terry, this has been uh, such a fun conversation. So fun. I love the book. And I love all of the work. Where can people learn more about it and dig in if they'd like to? I wanted to have something special for the Chris Cresser community because I feel I'm secretly part of it, right? As being you able to work with Chris. Mm -hmm. It matters to me. So I created a special link, terrygistbshow.com slash adapt. And that is where you will find a little free something called write your next chapter. And it is a standalone guide, though it's also nice as a companion to the Unfollow Your Passion book. But if you go there and you put your, you know, your stuff in, I will be in touch to send you that download. And it is essentially that. All the things we're talking about, time for you, the, the reader, the listener, to talk about it. It gives you a guidance Great. to the method I talked about and to express it and to see what comes up. 
So we'll put that in the show notes, and I'm going to spell it T-E-R-R-I-T-R-E-S-P-I-C-I-O dot com slash adapt. Terry, thank you so much. I really enjoyed this. And thank you, everyone who's listening. Highly recommend the book. It's uh, I think it'll really in, in a compassionate uh, but clear way help you to get clarity on some, maybe some some beliefs or assumptions or ideas that you've been uh, carrying with you that may not be serving you and you may not even be aware that, that, that are, you're carrying and aren't serving you. And that's, you know, a really powerful step towards more clarity and, and forward progress in, in your life. So thank you for writing this book, Terry. Thanks for being on thank the you. show. Thank you. Thanks everyone for listening. Keep sending your questions to chriscresser.com slash podcast question. We'll talk to you next time. That's the end of this episode of Revolution Health Radio. If you appreciate the show and want to help me create a healthier and happier world, please head over to iTunes and leave us a review. They really do make a difference. If you'd like to ask a question for me to answer on a future episode, you can do that at chriscresser.com slash podcast question. You can also leave a suggestion for someone you'd like me to interview there. If you're on social media, you can follow me at twitter.com slash chriscresser or facebook.com slash chriscresserlac. I post a lot of articles and research that I do throughout the week there that never makes it to the blog or podcast, so it's a great way to stay abreast of the latest developments. Thanks so much for listening. Talk to you next time.